And it gives me great pleasure to hear, I think, uh, from Dr. Pierce, an evidence-based account of his take on this policy going. Thanks, Ove. There goes my punchline, but hopefully most of you haven't picked up on that. A <laughs> um, couple of things at the outset. Firstly, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone for coming, whether you agree with what I'm going to say or not. The fact that you're interest interested enough to come along uh, is something I really appreciate. And the second thing is that I hope people are in the mood for red wine, because it's not going to be one of those speeches where you feel like champagne afterwards. <laughs> Let me at least try, though, to start on a positive note. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful one day, it's perfect the next, this great state. The beaches, some of the world's best coral reefs, a land of contrasts and so rich in history. Nearly two million square kilometres of land rich in commodities for which the world seems to have an insatiable appetite. Compared with those around us, we're richer, our incomes are growing faster, and our export-oriented economy enables our government to invest relatively more than other governments in infrastructure and education. More and more people are voting with their feet. Already one third of our population comes from across the border, bringing their skills, their enthusiasm, not to mention their capital, to invest in our success story. Yet there's a sense of foreboding as we come to grips with an unsettling reality. We're more exposed than other parts of the world to the looming threat of climate change. The projected increase in global temperatures of perhaps six degrees by this century's end could devastate natural assets that we hold dear, along with our agricultural base and our growing tourism industry, not to mention our water supplies. Lucrative and reliable as fossil fuel exports have been, generating income and jobs for our citizens, we, we know deep down that change is coming. As pressure to reduce greenhouse pollution intensifies, we know that 10 years from now, any state that exports a billion tonnes of CO2 a year will suffer political consequences for it. Hence all the forward planning, gas-fired electricity expansion and large-scale renewable energy projects. Hence the deliberate government plan to diversify our economy in the years ahead, to plan beyond the dig it up, ship it out dependence on emission-intensive commodities, anticipating a carbon-constrained global economy. And as difficult as that transition will be, the sooner we start, the better. Because we know that a cleaner, greener economy is ultimately in the interests of a smart state. And that wouldn't be possible without the foresight, leadership and personal engagement to the task of the Premier, His Majesty the King. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, some of you probably thought I was talking about Queensland not the state of Saudi Arabia. Things are quite different, I'm afraid to say, back in the so-called smart state. Sure, Queensland and Saudi Arabia have their similarities, about the same size, equally vulnerable, if not more so, to the impacts of climate change. And we too depend on fossil fuel exports. Our per capita greenhouse gas emissions are among the world's highest, and our population is growing faster than those around us. The other big similarity is that at some point between now and 2030, as their oil exports decline and our coal exports expand, Saudi Arabia and Queensland will both be exporting about a billion tonnes of CO2 annually. The two big differences are that in Queensland, there is no sense of foreboding and no diversification away from fossil fuels. On the contrary, whereas the reality of peak oil is setting in in Riyadh, in Brisbane there's a faith verging on fundamentalism that coal will meet most of the world's energy needs, not just this century, perhaps beyond. Our Premier has even gone so far as to publicly guarantee that a green solution to coal will be found. Here, when it comes to coal exports, environmental protection is more about protecting the Great Barrier Reef from the occasional coal spill, rather than protecting the climate from the emissions caused should the coal ship actually reach its intended destination. Here, when a coal baron announces his intention to export another 40 million tonnes of, of coal annually, the Premier shares the stage, while he's suing her, mind you, to announce it and lords it as great news. 
Here, unlike the Saudis, we're increasing our reliance on fossil fuels, not diversifying away from them. Here, state-owned railway companies brag in television ads that they carry 500,000 tonnes of coal on the average day, as if it's a good thing to add more greenhouse gas pollution daily than 300,000 cars do yearly. Here, the government's Climate Smart Leadership Award is sponsored by a company whose offshore coal mining produces more CO2 each year than the states of Western Australia, South Australia and Victoria combined. So while the Saudis are coming to terms with a new reality, here we see no reason even to acknowledge one. To our government's way of thinking, Queensland is on a winner with coal and our economy is having a blinder. We already see coal as the state's economic backbone, the benefactor whose generous royalties fund much of what government provides. We're in the early days of a 30-year super cycle boom and sitting on 33 billion tonnes of coal. So it's full steam ahead. Securing prosperity for Queensland in the years ahead is seemingly not about doing things differently, but about doing a great deal more of what we do right now. And on that basis, the Queensland Government is 100% behind the coal industry's plans to double exports in this, from this state in the next decade or so. New coal mines and coal seam gas wells are being approved across much of the state right now. Under prime Darling Downs agricultural land, aquifers and rivers at the headwaters of the Murray-Darling Basin, whole towns are being abandoned and swallowed. Nearly 1,000 new kilometres of railway track is being added to, to carry coal. New ports are being built, with a large share of the infrastructure being funded by the Queensland and federal governments. We've seen our fair share of mining rushes in Queensland, but never one like this. Counterintuitive, as it may seem to external observers, there's no hint that the Queensland government sees any contradiction between being climate smart and doubling the CO2 it exports in its coal. We show not a hint of embarrassment as we ignore scientists like James Hansen when they warn us that agreement to phase out coal use except where the CO2 is captured is 80% of the solution to the global warming crisis. Far from it. Since we take for granted that coal will be cleaned up in due course, we don't even see the emissions of, in our coal exports as a problem. And since they count in the country that burns the coal, they're certainly not seen as our problem. Queensland is concerned with emissions occurring within its borders, and it's mostly relying on a federally imposed carbon price to deal with that problem. On these grounds, the emissions generated by our coal exports our biggest contribution to climate change by far, are completely ignored in the state's official climate change strategy. The 424 page long document Climate Q towards a greener Queensland, released last year and dubbed by the Premier as the government's main weapon against the massive global threat of climate change, does not mention coal export emissions once. Instead, the focus is on, on dispelling the idea that individual action makes no difference with a host of climate smart programs aimed at proving that consumers and businesses and government agencies all working together can cumulatively help move Queensland towards a low carbon future. From every angle, it seems, everyone's being offered a government incentive to green up their act. The sheer number of people being mobilised is impressive, as are the greenhouse emission savings. Whether it's solar hot water on another 200,000 roofs, a million light, uh, energy efficient light bulbs being given away, 74,000 Queenslanders signing up for what's being called the Blight Government's low carbon diet, and over a quarter of a million Queenslanders taking advantage of the Climate Smart Home Service in search of emission cuts in the house. And the government's doing its bit just as eagerly, offsetting its official travel and government vehicles, with the plan being to offset all government buildings and vehicles by the year 2020. Meanwhile, fossil fuel based generation is being cleaned up with a 15% gas requirement, funding for clean coal projects and low emission conditions for any new coal fired power stations. Also, the government now requires that proposals to it come with a climate change impact statement. The action is even more frenetic on the renewable energy front, with the plan being to double Queensland's solar energy use in the next few years. 
Visitors to the city are already greeted on the road in from the airport with billboards welcoming them to the solar state. And seemingly everyone is getting involved to justify that claim that Queensland is the solar state and that it's doing the right thing as the catch cry goes. There are solar kindies, solar schools, solar sporting and community associations, solar railway stations, solar cities. And thanks in part to the Queensland Government help, the state has its first solar farm and the first solar coal hybrid power station is on its way, as is the largest photovoltaic rooftop array in Australia, which will turn the University of Queensland into the solar university. Home by home, school by school, street by street, city by city, as the ads put it, a virtual 500 megawatt power, solar power station is being created in Queensland. The sheer magnitude of public involvement makes it hard not to imagine that some sort of green revolution is sweeping the state. And it would seem that Queensland is on track to achieve the seemingly bold climate smart aim to reduce the carbon footprint of Queenslanders by one third by the year 2020. So, does Queensland have the winning formula? Are we actually showing to the world that the world's biggest coal exporting state can also be clean and green? Well, as with, as with most things that sound too good to be true, this is too. What's missing is the context. When we hear government say that it aims to cut the carbon footprint of Queenslanders by one third, it sounds to most people as if Queensland's carbon footprint is being cut by one third. Some by government ministers, including the climate change minister, even seem to believe that if you read their press statements. Yet as ever, the devil is in the detail. The target actually applies to the emissions of Queensland households, which are only 16% of the state's emissions total, or roughly one-sixth. So we're really talking about cutting less than one-sixth of our emissions by one-third. Hence, as laudable as it is for Queenslanders to cut their emissions by one-third, it actually has very little impact on the state's overall carbon footprint. Householders are busily doing their bit and no doubt feeling justifiably greener for it, but the state's carbon footprint is growing in spite of all their efforts. And if we factor in the projected growth by the year 2020, and that's the, that's the year to, to which the target actually applies, it soon becomes apparent that it's hard to argue that Queensland is in fact doing the, right, the bright thing. By 2020, its emissions are still much higher than today. And by 2050, unless there's a major policy shift, they will be at least 30% higher than today. And that's before we even start factoring in the emissions generated by Queensland's growing coal exports. But before we do that, let's have a closer look at that export industry. Australia is the undisputed king of the global seaborne coal trade. Australia produces around a third of the world's coal exports. We provide half of the metallurgical coal exports for steelmaking. Only Indonesia comes close to Australia, and Australian companies mine more than a third, between a third and a half, of Indonesian exports as well. Australian companies play a similarly prominent role in the fastest growing coal exporting nations as well, places like Mongolia and Mozambique. Producing two thirds of Australia's coal exports, Queensland is to the Australian coal industry what the Australian coal industry is to the global trade, the mothership.